TII item 484, July 30th, 2019, iOS 12.4 and iOS 13, betas 3, 4, and 5. In this episode, we cover iOS 12.4 Gold Master release as well as iOS 13, betas 3, 4, and 5, speculation and rumors on the iPhone's 2019, and Apple's latest quarterly report, plus listener feedback, all covered in depth starting after the intro. Welcome to Today in iPhone. Yeah, I like it a lot. Today in iPhone. Hey, cool! Oh, yeah. My beautiful iPhone, which I never have out of my hand and that I do everything with and has become an extension of who I am. Today's episode is brought to you by Eero. To get $100 off the Eero base unit and two beacons package and one year Eero Plus, please visit Eero.com slash TII and to check out, enter promo code TII. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Rob, and you are listening to the Today in iOS podcast. First up, I want to thank Jeff for sending in the music here in the background. Jeff wrote, Hi, Rob. I made this song called Fantasy with my iPhone using GarageBand app. For free downloads and more music, follow me at JeffJ6 on Twitter. Regards, JeffJ. Well, thanks, Jeff, for the music. And folks, I will put the full song at the end of the episode. Also want to thank John for sending in the artwork for today's show. John wrote the following. Hi, Rob. This photo was made with Typerama for my iPad Air 2 running iOS 11.4. And this photo was taken at my sister's place in Vancouver, British Columbia, while I was visiting an iPhone and iPhone 7 128 gig. Regards, John Petrie. Well, thanks, John, for sending this in. Folks, you can see this artwork in the free TI app via the bonus button for episode 484 or at Instagram.com slash Today in iOS and also at Facebook.com slash Today in iOS. If you have some artwork and or music you have created on your iOS device that you would like to share with the audience, please email it to me at todayinios at gmail.com. Please make sure to include which app or apps you use to create said artwork and or music and if possible, folks, please make them square images. Square images. Really need square images. So I need more images. I need square images. Got a lot of rectangle ones. I need some square ones. And send them in and put TII logo on it. Into the news we go. Apple released iOS 12.4 on July 22nd. So what changed, you ask? Well, according to Apple, quote, iOS 12.4 introduces iPhone migration to directly transfer data from an old iPhone to a new iPhone includes enhancements to Apple News Plus and improves the security of your iPhone or iPad. This update, iPhone migration, introduces the ability to wirelessly transfer data and migrate directly from an old iPhone to a new iPhone during setup. Apple News makes downloaded issues accessible in the My Magazine section, plus offline and online adds all publications in the Apple News Plus, including newspapers, to the catalog at the top of the News Plus feed, adds the ability to clear downloaded magazine issues by selecting History, Clear, and Clear All. Other improvements and fixes, it includes a security fix for the Walkie Talkie app on the Apple Watch and re-enables Walkie Talkie functionality. This release also includes support for a HomePod in Japan and Taiwan, unquote. Interesting. One thing not mentioned by Apple is Apple Card, which was expected to be the main reason for iOS 12.4. So, um, yeah, fooled us, Apple did. Apple did also release watchOS 5.3, which fixes a walkie-talkie security bug, a bug that caused Apple to vault walkie-talkie for a few weeks. But it is back. And if you have a Series 4 Apple Watch and live in Canada and Singapore... Good news, watchOS 5.3 brings ECG feature to you, which is a great feature and the reason I bought my Apple Watch Series uh, 4. So if you're in Canada and Singapore, congratulations, you finally get the best feature of the the Apple Watch Series 4. Back to iOS 12.4. It also brings 19 security patches. These patches address issues that could have allowed a remote attacker to execute code or view sensitive information or, well, other bad and unexpected things. But really, they had me at sensitive information. So, should you update? Well, I have three words for you. Release the hounds! Yes, it is time to release the hounds on iOS 12.4. I have not seen any reports or received any reports of any real issues. 
I updated my iOS 12 devices to it last week. I have two devices that are on iOS 13. The rest are on iOS 12.4 now. And again, on my side, no issues to report on iOS 12.4. If you have any sensitive data on your device, you really do need to update to iOS 12.4 right away. Release the hounds! I had a question come in on how in the world do you cancel your subscription to CBS All Access? I think this person was like me. They had signed up for CBS All Access for the Star Trek uh, Discovery. And when it was over, they wanted to cancel. And it's not easy to find on how to cancel. But here you go. And this is on your iOS device. One, tap on the Settings app. Two, scroll down and tap on iTunes and App Store. Three, tap on your Apple ID at the top. Four, tap View Apple ID in the pop-up. It may ask you to sign in or use Face ID to sign in. Five, scroll to subscription, then tap on it. Six, tap the subscription you want to manage, i.e. remove. Seven, then tap on cancel subscription. Eight, finally tap to confirm you want to cancel it. So in all, that was at least eight taps and two scrolls to unsubscribe to a subscription. Nice and easy peasy. If you didn't catch all of that, you can go back to time code 0517, so 5 minutes and 17 seconds, and replay this segment because it is not easy to find and it, <laughs> it's a little buried. If you are paying for CBS All Access this summer, and well, you saw that trailer for Picard, you may have realized that it said at the end, there's no need to be paying for CBS All Access until early 2020 when Picard is finally released which, yes, absolutely I will sign back up at that time. But for now, no need for it, unless, of course, they do release another season of Discovery in the fall, and in which case, then I'll sign up then. But for right now, there's no reason to be paying for CBS All Access that I can see, at least for me as a Trekkie. Uh, I can't wait for Picard. And when that comes out, I will definitely be signing up. Heck, the only reason I, I'm keeping HBO now that I think about it, because uh, now the Game of Thrones is over, is John Oliver at this point, so HBO keep John Oliver around. Um, although, The Watchmen sure looks good, but if you want to cancel HBO and you're not a John Oliver fan or not interested in Watchmen at this point, the same process for canceling HBO if you haven't canceled that. Apple released a few betas for iOS 13 in the last month, and when I say iOS 13, I also mean iPad OS 13 as well. And the first was on, well, the third, I guess you would say, was July 12th. And that was iOS Beta 3. Then about two weeks later on... Ooh, wow, my New York accent came out there. About two weeks later, on July 17th, Apple released Beta 4 of iOS 13. And then finally in July, on July 29th, a little less than two weeks later, Apple released iOS 13 Beta 5. Expect Beta 6 to be free probably in another two weeks, somewhere in the middle of August, and then another two weeks after that, Beta 7. Traditionally, beta 5 was where I would start using a no dot update on my primary phone. But this year, I've been running iOS 13 on my main phone since beta 2. And it's not been all bad. Uh, it's been actually pretty good. Some small bugs and issues here and there. I have to keep force quitting mail and reopening it. But beta 3 was the least stable of them all, for me at least. Beta 4 was better. So beta 2 was better than beta 3. Beta 4 was better than beta 3 and 2. And beta 5, I updated late Monday evening, so jury is still out on it. Remember, as good as it has been, beta equals bugs. Repeat after me, beta equals bugs. In summary, some of the new features found in betas 3, 4, and 5 are, there is a new pop-up screen for secure recording features in the home app for cameras. There is a new teaser image for Apple Arcade. Not really sure that's a feature, just a change. There is a new FaceTime attention correction setting if you have the iPhone XS or XS Max only. For some reason, the archive button in the Mail app is now purple. The addition of a new Me tab in the Find My app. If you are at the home screen and you long press on an app, there is now an option at the bottom of the pop-up menu called Rearrange Apps. Selecting this puts the apps in the wiggle mode and you can move them around or delete them as needed. In the Messages app, previously there was a microphone in the message bar where if you tapped on it, it would record a message. 
Well, the icon changes to a circle with an audio waveform in it, which is the audio waveform for the word app, or at least that's what it looks like when I look at it. With the iPad OS 13 Beta 5, you can adjust the home screen density for icons, uh, picking between a 4x5 grid of apps or a 6x5 grid of apps. You choose bigger for app icon, you get the 20 apps. You choose more, you get the 30 apps, not counting the ones in the dock at the bottom. As with all no dot updates, some features go away too. The automation tab in the shortcuts app has been removed. I did see some reports that one of the Apple engineers reported on Twitter, this is a temporary removal and it'll be back in a later updates. Of course, just because someone says they are an Apple engineer on Twitter does not make them so, but I followed them just in case. There is a new smaller cursor option for mouse support in iPad OS 13. There is a Siri for everyone setup screen, but this requires HomePod OS 13. The volume control is finer. I actually like this one a lot. The, the volume control is finer in beta 5. In beta 4 and earlier, it required 16 taps to move through the full volume range. Same with iOS 12.4 and any earlier versions. But iOS 13 beta 5, it is now 34 clicks or taps on the volume up or down to move all the way through the range. This means over twice as granular for the volume control. If you were trying to find the right volume level sweet spot for this show or anything that you listen to, this will make it easier. The other thing I like is if you push and hold down the volume button, it does not go right to mute. It is actually goes down, but faster, not jumping right to mute. I always hated that when you were full volume and you go to push it down a little bit just to lower it a little bit and you held it in just a little too long, it go, boom, it go completely to mute. It doesn't do that anymore. Okay. Those are some of the key changes with iOS 13, betas 3, 4, and 5. And then I'm going to get in here in a little bit more on what are the changes in the back end and the settings and other things. So we'll get into that in a second. But first, some voicemail. Hello, Rob. It's Justin from Pennsylvania. I wanted to give my first impressions of the iOS 13 public beta. I um, put it on one of my phones, and so far it's been very stable. And I really like the new dark mode. It's easier on the eyes at night. It's I much prefer it to night shift. I never quite like the orange effect with the night shift, so I like being able to have all your native apps blacked out, and I can't wait till the third-party support of that happens. I'm kind of iffy. One of the biggest things I was, I was excited about was the swipe keyboard, and I don't know that I like Apple's implementation of the swipe keyboard. I'd have to try it out for a few more days to see if I like it. I might have to go back to Gboard, which I really got used to over the past couple of years. Then I would have to say I really like how they beefed up the Reminders app. It's way more usable. Things don't get just jammed in the list. It lets you make it makes it a lot easier to look at. It tells you what reminders are due for today in the upper left hand corner, which is really nice. I think the reminders got a big update, and the Notes app also got a nice update, very similar. Just making it more usable. You can look at your notes in a grid view, so you can actually see the, more of the note rather than just like the first line in a list. I, I like that a lot. Safari, I, I like how much easier it is to change the size of the text per website. I like that a lot. And I just think all in all, it's a, it's a really solid update. It's given me a little more bell and whistle than last time, but this time around, it feels like they're polishing up some of the things that have been not so good for a long time. I'm glad that they're finally doing it. So far, the beta is running very smooth. Obviously, you want to be careful if you're putting it on your main device. But so far, I haven't seen any compatibility issues, and I've used it. The battery life, you get the regular battery drain that you get with a beta, but hey, you know, it's a beta. So, But all in all, I think this is a really solid beta, and I'm excited for the full version coming in the fall. Thank you very much, Rob. Have a great day. Bye. Justin, thanks for the feedback, and I'm glad to hear you say that you weren't all that impressed or liking the swipe feature, because I didn't like the swipe feature either. So it's not because you're already trained to it. I just There's something about the implementation of it I just... I don't know. I just couldn't get used to it. Didn't feel right. No pun intended. I couldn't put my finger on it, but there's just something off on the swipe implementation. If anyone else is running iOS 13 betas and like swipe feature that you've used in others or have never tried swipe before Apple's implementation, let us know your thoughts on that. Give us a call 206-666-6364. 
That's 206 Moondog. Or shoot us an email to todayinios at gmail.com. And please let us know your thoughts. Today's advertiser is longtime sponsor and friend of the show, Eero. For those new to the show, Eero, E-E-R-O, makes a Wi-Fi mesh network for your home. And as I've mentioned in previous episodes, Eero offers the fastest Wi-Fi I've ever tested. I work from home, but I am starting to think I may have more than two kids that live in my house. As it seems each morning, there's a knock at the door, and in comes a couple more boys, and off to the basement they all go to play Fortnite and other games. And why my house? Because we have the one house that can handle four players at once, no slow down. Eero is also a Wi-Fi mesh network, just like at office buildings, but now for your home. You only need to hardwire connect the base station unit, the beacons you just plug into any wall outlet, and they even have a nightlight. Never think about Wi-Fi again. Get $100 off the Eero base unit and two beacons package and a one year of the Eero Plus service. Please visit Eero.com slash TII and at checkout enter promo code TII. With Eero Plus, you get total network protection with the ability to block malicious and unwanted content across your entire network. You get advanced security, content blocking, and ad blocking. Eero even automatically pushes out software updates that make sure you have the latest security protection for your home network. And the units also have a new thread radio for lower power devices like my Ring doorbell and other Wi-Fi enabled IoT devices. Again, to get $100 off the Eero base unit and two beacon package and one year of Eero Plus, please visit Eero.com slash TII and at checkout enter promo code TII. As I said before, this is the best, best, best Wi-Fi I have ever tested or heard of. Thank you, Eero, for supporting this show. In the last episode, I went over those new major items in iOS 13 in the settings app. He changes, as mentioned, were one accessibility broken out into its own item, and the addition of shortcuts. Getting into the settings app this episode in more detail, first change we'll cover is in the screen time item. Uh, there is now the addition of communication limits. This allows you to say whose screen time limits apply to with the iPhone, FaceTime, uh, with phone, FaceTime, messages, and AirDrop. Essentially allowing you to set limits based on your contacts, uh, who they are, and who they are not. Next is general, and the biggest change is accessibility was removed, as we mentioned, and is now its own item. Beyond that, there really is only very, very minor changes in the items that remain in general. There are a couple of new swipe options under keyboard, and they moved around the keyboard items to make more sense. But really, general does go from the one that we spent the most time talking about in the past to one of the lower tier items uh, in, in the whole settings menu. Under display and brightness is one of the most noticeable changes in iOS 13, literally that is, and we are talking about dark mode. This is where you can turn it on, you can either choose between the two options, light or dark mode. And yes, I have been seduced over to the dark side. I have been running dark mode for over a month and I'm liking it. There is also an option for automatic where it will switch at sunrise to light mode and at sunset to dark mode. Or you can pick a custom schedule if you'd like. Next up is the brand new top level category, accessibility, which was pulled out of the general section. When you go into accessibility, one of the first things you will see that is different is that each of the main it's each of those main items in accessibility now has an icon with it. Voiceover, zoom, magnifier, they all all the main items in accessibility have an icon to the left of them. They also broke it out into four main categories: vision, physical and motor, hearing, and general. Previously, there was media and also learning. Those are gone, and generals replaced them. So starting with vision, there is a new item called display and text size, which is where Apple gathered up quite a few different items into their own group. And this includes bold text, larger text, button shapes, on and off labels, reduce transparency, increase contrast, differentiate without color, Smart invert, classic invert, color filters, reduce white point and auto brightness. 
All are now under settings, accessibility, display, and text size. And it does really make a lot of sense for Apple to group them the way they have. They are all the items for those with visual impairments to make it easier to customize the display and text for their individual needs. Next new item is motion. This combines reduced motion, autoplay message effects, autoplay video previews, and limit from rate, frame rate controls. FYI, this is where autoplay video previews can be turned off. One of those things turned on by default and annoying until you find out you can actually turn it off. Next in vision is spoken content with the speak selection first up. Turning this on enables a speak button to appear when you select text. Speak screen, when enabled, allows two finger swipe down from the top of the screen to read all that is on the screen. Then there is speech controller. If speak screen is turned on, this allows you to quickly access speak screen and speak on touch, and you can add some of the actions to it. Then there is highlight content. Uh, typing feedback, voices, speaking rate, and pronunciations. Finally, Envision is audio descriptions, which is off by default. Next section in accessibility is physical and motor. Previously, this was called interaction. It now starts with touch, which has a few items under it, assistive touch, touch accommodations, and shake to undo, which is on by default but is where you can turn it off. And given if you now double tap with three fingers, you can undo. It is much easier than shake to undo and less likely for your device to fly across the room trying to shake to undo. Again, settings, accessibility, touch, and then turn off shake to undo. I highly recommend you turn that shake to undo off. And then in the subsection, uh, for some reason, they call, uh, call audio routing because Yes, that makes so much sense here under touch. I don't know why they have call audio routing there. Next item, which is only for devices with Face ID, is Face ID and Attention. This was moved down from the Vision section, and they added in a new option, Haptic on Successful Authentication. It is off by default, but if turned on, it gives you a haptic response when you unlock your device with Face ID, authorize Apple Pay, or verify iTunes and App Store purchases. The next main item is Switch Control, which has all the same items as before under it. And then Voice Control, which is a new item, and I will not cover it now, as it really deserves its own breakout on a future episode. Voice control allows you to use your voice to control your iOS device. This will be huge for some, as in life-changing huge, and will be something others can use as well for productivity reasons. Again, more about voice control on a future episode. Next is side button, same as before. And then next is home button. And then Apple TV remote, which is new, and there is an option for directional buttons, if turned on, says use buttons on the iPad, Apple TV remote, uh, instead of swipe gestures. By default, it is turned off. Last item in physical and motor is keyboard. And there is a new feature in it called full keyboard access. By default, turned off. I thought maybe turning this on for iPad, if using the Apple smart keyboard, it would finally start and stop playing videos on YouTube? Um, well, sort of, kind of. Sometimes it did, sometimes not so much. You need to go to full screen on the video and then tab with the keyboard to put a white bar around the whole screen, the whole video. Then you can tap or click the space bar to sometimes start and stop. It was, to say the least, acting like a beta. So maybe this will work better when this goes to Goldmaster as we get through more betas here in August and September. Next major category in accessibility is hearing. First item is hearing devices, previously known as MFI hearing devices. Next is RTT slash TTY, same as before. Then next is audio and visual. This is where they moved mono audio toggle and balance adjust and also moved LED flash for alerts which is toggled off by default. 
And then the last item in hearing is subtitles and captioning. And the fourth and final category in accessibility is general. No more media and no more learning categories. First item in general is guided access and followed by Siri and then accessibility shortcuts and all have the same options as before. That is the full coverage of accessibility with the exception of voice control, which we'll go over on a future episode. If you are sight impaired, finding all these different features and where they moved is difficult. Go back to 16 minutes and 52 seconds into this episode to start re-listening to this whole section so you can hear where all those accessibility items were moved around to. I mean, it's great that Apple broke it out, but they did move things around, some of which made a lot of sense on why they reorganized things, some not so much. But again, go back to 16 minutes and 52 seconds if you want to hear this repeat of, the, of all of where all those moves were. Now we're gonna go back into the main list under settings wallpaper there is a new option called dark appearance dims wallpaper and it looks horrible if your wallpaper is a photo well at least it did for the ones i tested it next up is in the mail settings there are a few small additions first flag style was removed uh, next under threading there are three new items muted thread action ignore block senders, and then blocked to see who those are that are blocked. Next up, the changes are in reminders. There are a few items added into the settings. For all day reminders, you can pick the specific time of the day that you get a reminder, and you have the option to show as overdue all day reminders starting on the next day. In the phone settings, there is a new item, silence unknown callers, off by default. If you turn it on, it will silence any calls from unknown numbers, and they will be sent to voicemail and then displayed on the recent lists. Ooh, I really want to turn that on. Next is Safari setting, and Apple moved a lot of them around. They have a couple of new categories, but I think the biggest item is downloads, which by default, they are to your iCloud account. But you can change that to your device, which I recommend. And then you can see the file downloaded from a website right in the files app. So now if you go to a website and there's a link where you can download something, it will go right into your files app. I love this new feature. In the book setting, there were a couple of new options. First is reading goals. It will show the time spent reading and other achievement goals. And there is now an option with audiobooks in the book app um, to set external controls to either skip forward or back a certain number of seconds or to go next or previous on the chapter. Podcast settings, zip, nada, nothing changed. And again, Next to voice control, that covers most of the changes in iOS 13 for the settings app. Hello, Rob. This is Justin from Pennsylvania. I'm calling to give a follow-up. I've been running the iOS 13 public beta and just give my impressions of it. I have definitely run into some bugs, some apps that I use every day that didn't work. So just be warning to anyone, if again, you know the beta means bugs that you always tell us, but also it means apps that may not be able to use, but it's been fine. I'm nothing game breaking for me, but uh, I have to say I've grown to like this right keyboard. I don't think I'm going back to Gboard like I have said before. I very much like the new keyboard now that I have it. Probably the only thing I want them to add is a tactic keyboard like Gboard has. The so last thing I think they need. I like the Apple's phone and has such a great um, response with the vibration. In fact, they feel really good on a keyboard, so it'd be nice if they put that in. But uh, that's just uh, nitpicky stuff. Overall, I love dark mode. Can't wait till everything's in dark mode all the time. I like it. I like it day and night. I'm not someone that switches with the daytime. I keep it on all the time. I like that. I really, really like the dark mode. I'm very, very happy with it. It's uh, easier on the eyes at night, and I just like it as a, as a look all around better. But uh, I'm trying to think of anything else. Oh, I love the new Notes app. I really like it. I really like the reminders app. I think I said that before. 
I love the new Animoji stickers, which I know you always hate talking about Animoji, but the stickers with the, uh, it has the, um, mind blown and the heart to rise. I don't know. I like them. I, I'm silly, but I, I do like them. <laughs> um, um, all in all, I'm very happy with this release. It has a little more here and there. The series sounds a lot better. I'm uh, really looking forward to it being more stable. So thank you very much, Rob. Have a great day. Bye. Justin, as always, thanks for your feedback and glad to hear that you are liking the swipe keyboard. It's still something I just couldn't get used to. Again, folks, if you have some feedback on iOS 13, any features, anything that you like, give us a call, 206-666-6364. That's 206-MOON-DOG. Or shoot us an email, todayinios at gmail.com. And speaking of email feedback, here is one. Hi, Rob. I was wondering if I bought an unlocked iPhone and sent it to my friend in Australia, could she use it? Does it have to be GSM and CDMA unlocked? Thanks, Aaron in Vermont. Well, hi, Aaron. For the iPhone, let's assume you're going for the top end because you wouldn't want to send a female friend in Australia anything other than the best. So let's assume you're going for the iPhone XS Max. In Australia, they use model A2101. In the U.S., it is A1921. Overall, there's four different iPhone XS Max versions globally. The iPhone XS Max A1921 in the U.S. is only available in the United States, and it works on both GSM and CDMA networks. The A2101 is the global version widely available in most countries in Europe and Asia. This model doesn't support CDMA networks. It supports dual SIM cards, one eSIM and one nano SIM card. So long of the short, no, don't do that. Don't send her an iPhone. Send her money and you know, via PayPal and let your friend get their iPhone in Australia. That will be the best solution. Well, assuming she really is a she and she's not some guy by the name of Steve impostering himself as a she. So as long as you know this woman is really a woman in Australia and you know them offline, yes, then send the money. If it's somebody you met in a MeWe chat, you may want to hold off. Back to the email back. Good morning, Rob. I just want to let you know that I've been using LastPass as a password manager and just recently upgraded to their family's play. It, um, it seems to work very well. My only concern is that we have a large family, and I'd like to have it be able to handle more than six licenses. Thanks. Bye. Regards, Skip Sears. Thank you, Skip. And again, that was last pass, one word. Hi, Rob. I use 1Password, as I can use it with Windows and Parallels to sync all my passwords on all my devices. Regards, Glenn A. And then 1Password is also used by Brian L. and Rhonda P. And we have this voicemail. Hey, good day, Rob. This is Sterling. I just wanted to give you a call in response to your question about what uh, password manager that I use. And um, this is this is a really, really a neat one. It's called Keeper. And I mean, I love it because not only does it uh, manage my passwords, but it also allows you to be able to put in credit card information and other things such as that. And it also has, a, I guess, basically an option to be able to fill in particular, uh, I guess, forms or what have you, you know, with your data. So between the, uh, the keychain and Keeper, for the most part, I'm well covered, and it makes it really, really easy and simple. And I also use Keeper when it, you know, when I need to generate a password. Because what you can do, is you go in, uh, you open it up. You say you want to create, uh, you know, a new account. It opens it up and it brings you to a portion where you can put your password in, or these, where you can request a password, and you can set the parameters. You know, how many lowercase, uppercase, uh, you know, numbers, special characters, and how many uh, that you want to put in there, and then it'll automatically do that for you. So it's gotten me to a place where I don't even think about it much anymore. Uh, when I have to do something, I just go ahead, do what I just explained to you, and create new passwords, slap them into, um, you know, the old uh, area or into a new place, and uh, I'm all set. And the only thing that you have to remember is your master password, just, just pretty much as it is with the uh, other password managers. But anyway, this thing is great, and you can utilize it where you guys can – kind of have a situation where more than one person is on the account. So if something was to happen, and as you probably know, this has happened before, 
or you know, people have died, you know, and uh, they didn't have any way of knowing what their significant others uh, or their mother or father's passwords were, you know, to get into certain things, and they ended up losing nice keepsakes, you know, like recordings of voices and things along that line. But anyway, I digress. I thank you for your time. Have a good day. Fantastic show. Thanks, Sterling, and everyone else for your feedback on your password managers. Again, we had LastPass, we had 1Password, and we had Keeper. Again, thanks, everyone, for your suggestions. And now let's get into some official Apple news from the past month. Apple announced they will acquire the majority of Intel's smartphone modem business for about $1 billion, give or take a $100 million. You know, what's that between friends? This gets Apple about 2,200 Intel employees and most importantly, a nice additional portfolio of patents around mobile communication. Some say this will lead the way to Apple quickly rolling out their own 5G chipsets. Well, except for, you know, that whole five-year licensing deal Apple just signed with Qualcomm earlier this year. So what does this mean to you and I in the short term? This year and next, most likely nothing. Longer term, it will give Apple some additional design options. I just hope they pick the technically better option and not just the one they own option. If they can't get to the speeds and performance that Qualcomm offers or get past it, stick with the Qualcomm chipsets. Other Apple news, Sir Johnny Ive announced he will be packing up his California digs and moving across the pond back home where he'll start his own company, who has as its first client, Apple. Yep, Sir Johnny Ive is out at Apple, which I'm still not sure how I feel about this. I mean, if the new person puts the HDMI and SD card ports back in the MacBook Pro, then it might not be so bad. But right now, overall, I think it makes me nervous that Sir Johnny A will not be leading Apple's design team, which means this will be something that's new to Apple without Johnny at the helm. Uh, it's been since the mid-90s since they've had someone else running their design team. Hopefully the new guy does not like dongles and does like ports. This is Aaron. I live in Brooklyn, New York, was at a T-Mobile store in my parents' hometown of St. Louis, Missouri. I'm not disclosing names or anything, but the guy who works at T-Mobile has a second job as a Apple tech for Apple. What he, he has all the apps and he knows how to program. So he gets paid for this. And when I was asking him, saying that no one knows, maybe they do now, I don't know. But uh, he said, I know that uh, the new iPhone will be 5G. If he really knows and he's telling the truth, this was a guy who works for T-Mobile and Apple. He tests all the apps to make sure they're working. He showed me his phone with dark mode. And he is not just a developer who gets the pre-testy iOS. He's actually worked for them. He's getting paid. So he gets stuff that regular people do not get. So at the end, he said, when I mentioned about 5G, he said the new iPhone coming this year will have 5G. That's just something that someone told me who seems to know. Okay, you have a wonderful day. Keep up the show. They're great. Thank you. Bye. Hi, Aaron. It seems the guy you ran into at T-Mobile store that is moonlighting for Apple. Um, yeah, leg pulling did he. It is highly unlikely this person has any inside info at all about Apple's plans about anything. And 5G is not just anything. It's a huge, huge, big something. But sadly, most people following Apple at this point disagree with the Apple Moonlighter. According to Ming-Chi Kuo, the iPhone 2020 models will support 5G, but not any of the iPhone 2019 models. Ming says both years will see three new models released, same as in 2018. That would be the bigger, the even bigger, and the really, really big version. Sadly, no word on the iPhone SE, or as my wife calls it, the iPhone that is the right size for her. But Ming is saying now that all three versions of the 2020 iPhone will support 5G, but again, none of the 2019 models will. And that's pretty much universal through the whole rumor mill. Or as my kids would say, please say it ain't so because they know daddy is not updating his iPhone 
this year if 5G is not an option. And right now I have no plans of updating my iPhone this year because nothing is indicating that it's going to be 5G this year. I would be very, very surprised if Apple releases 5G this year. So let's focus for a few minutes on the 2019 rumors. And for the new iPhones this year, all quote leak unquote photos of the 10s max replacements show it with a huge and ugly square camera bump on the back where the three cameras and a and i guess the flash would sit so either these photos are all fake and they're coming from multiple sources which in the past has not been the case of them being fake at this point prior to launch i mean i.e two months before launch the last few years We've had the photos at this point of what the iPhone was going to look like. Or the photos are accurate. You know, it, it, and I'm, I'm going to assume the photos are, are accurate. And we are going to get a monster of a camera bump on the next version. I think that really is... I, I just can't believe at this point all those photos are fake. Um, so I, I believe we're, we're going to see a really ugly camera bump going forward uh, for at least the iPhone XS Max and possibly the XS replacements. Not for the replacement for the XR. It would likely, if it gets any bump um, from the 10, it, it would get, you know, it'd go to two cameras and you'd see the same bump that we see currently on the XS and the XS Max. Um, a couple of rumors had only the XS Max replacement going to the triple camera, way too large bump. Um, as a way to differentiate it from the 10s replacement. The screen sizes would remain the same, but the 10R replacement would get bumped to up to OLED, according to a few rumors. Other rumors say not so fast, only OLEDs for the top two priced phones. One new rumored feature is a slow motion video feature for the front facing camera, because we so need to see in slow-mo that the duck face pose selfie as it slowly and agonizingly comes into perfect position. Yes, selfie slow-mo is so needed. Not. Most are saying either way, the selfie camera will be getting an upgrade, maybe even to a 12 megapixel camera, possibly even allowing for a wider angle of view. So you don't have to get a stick and get it so far away and get all your friends in. One rumor that continues is that Apple will ship the iPhone with an 18 watt fast charging brick. I thought this rumor was out last year and it, I thought around this time they had the same rumor last year and, and it didn't come to fruition. And speaking of charging, you'd also be able to charge other devices. It seems this rumor is ripped right from a Samsung commercial. There are rumors that this is the year the iPhone switches to USB-C but only one or two. I think we are another year away from that at best. I think most rumors say, no, it's going to stay lightning this year. Of course, there are rumors about the upgraded processor and improved FaceTime and other obvious improvements that really aren't rumors, just common sense. We will recap as we get closer to the Apple event, which right now looks to be either September 10th or 11th. Um, let's just say this, a source in the know, i.e. my calendar, right now is saying that the next Apple event will be at 10 a.m. Pacific time on Tuesday, September 10th. So you heard that right. An inside source, uh, we'll call it iCal. Uh, we'll call him iCal. My inside source is saying Tuesday, September 10th at 10 a.m. Pacific time is when the next Apple event. I expect to start seeing some blog posts with reported sources in the know also reporting this. The new iPhones would be in users' hands on Friday, September 20th, according to my source, iCal. Also, iOS 13 will go live on Tuesday, the 17th of September, for the Goldmaster release to the masses, according to iCal. Hi, Rob. It's Joe in Cebu, Philippines. It's been a quite a long time since I phoned in, but I have good reason. I need to know if any of your listeners have experienced the same problem that I'm experiencing with my 8+. Plus. The other day, I was um, out of the city, and I had LTE on, and I was listening to an internet radio program and went to sleep because it was, you know, late in the morning, and then I woke up and called my phone saying, no service. So I checked with my carrier, no updates available, it's prepaid, so I have enough balance, I 
switch sims. I did everything on the list, toggle the airplane mode, reboot the phone three different ways. I redid the settings, took it to Apple, did a hard reset, nothing. It still says no service. And I also checked to see if the phone, it's an unlocked iPhone. I got it in Japan two years ago. I thought maybe it somehow got locked, but I read up on it and said that that doesn't happen. I just looked up again. Other, I've heard that, I've read that people are experiencing problems with the new, with the latest update of 12.3.2. And the only problem I have is cellular. Now, this is the funny thing. If you take the SIM out, it says there's no SIM, okay? And then if you go to cellular, you can't toggle it on and off. So, But when you put the SIM in, it does a search. It says no service. If you look at cellular, you can turn that on and off. You can also turn on the hotspot. How could that be? And one more thing, in settings under phone, it's the number is listed. It reads the number, but it can't tell me the network, and it just can't connect or find a signal, and I'm going out of my mind. So please, if anybody knows what's going on, because I'm in the Philippines, and Apple said, Apple Philippines said, we don't fix that problem. So I'm kind of stuck. Thank you, and I hope to hear from you guys soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Joe, sorry to hear of your issues, and if anyone out there can help Joe, has any ideas to help Joe, Give us a call, 206-666-6364, or shoot us an email today in iOS at gmail.com. Into the email bag we go. Hello. Hi, Rob. Thanks for breaking down some of the new features of the iOS 13 beta and iPad OS 13. Wonder if iCloud Keychain will have family sharing support. Would like to be able to share certain passwords with my family. Regards, Robert from Long Island. Robert, thanks for the email. And earlier in the show, Skip Sears told us about LastPass, which does allow you to share passwords with families. But if anyone has tried in iOS 13 to do a family share, I'm not aware. I haven't tried it because I, I don't have that set up. But if anyone has tried to do family share with Keychain, let us know if that worked. Hey, Rob. It's Ryan from Seattle. Question for you. I have an iPhone XS. I have it set up with my iCloud account. My Apple ID is plugged in and the whole nine yards. It's uh, registered to me uh, and all that. I have a work phone, an iPhone 8, that my work has given me that I have never plugged in my Apple ID, never registered my personal iCloud account with it, nothing like that. However, when my wife FaceTimes me, both of my phones ring, my personal phone and my work phone ring, telling me that I have a FaceTime call that is coming in. Any idea why that's occurring to you or your listeners? Uh, for the life of me, I don't know why that's happening. Um, I don't know how to fix it. Uh, if you could help, I'd be greatly appreciated or any of the listeners. Thanks so much. Have a good day, buddy. See ya. Mariana, I'm going to ask, have you gone to settings and then phone and then calls on other devices and see if that's turned on? Uh, it shouldn't work if you haven't logged into an Apple ID, but go ahead and see if that's turned on. So again, that's settings, phone, and then calls on other devices. While you're there, also check FaceTime and look under FaceTime and you can be reached by FaceTime at and then look at some of the other uh, devices that you have check marks next to there. So settings, phone, and then also settings, FaceTime, see what you've got turned on. If anyone else has any suggestions for Ryan about why this might be happening, please let us know. And an email here. Hi, Rob. What would be a good Thunderbolt 3 USB-C hub you recommend or use? David D. Well, I am not using any USB-C hubs right now other than some small ones that I got from Apple, their Apple ones, for my wife's MacBook. But if anyone out there has any suggestions, please let us know. There were a couple that we've mentioned in the past on the show that were Kickstarter projects. And then the company uh, Hyper, they have a few different ones out there as well. But anyone out there with a MacBook Pro or a MacBook that's USB-C or the new iPad Pro that's just USB-C and you have a good hub that you like and would like to recommend, please give us a call or shoot us an email. Hello, Rob. Daniel, Wisbeach, Cambridgeshire. My mate, right, doesn't realize that the iPhone has force touch. Um, he's been an iPhone user for, I don't know how long now. 
they just might got me thinking, I wonder who else doesn't know about half the things these iPhones can do. They seem to cram a lot of stuff in, especially with iOS, is it 13 just around the corner? I do lose track. And uh, I wondered if there was uh, a part of your TII app you could dedicate to educating people. I don't know. Anyway, have you got a patron anyway, by the way, or don't you like money? I'll just try to work it out. Some people on podcasts, they go for patrons to get money or something. I think like, I feel like you mentioned me a little bit on the podcast. I'll listen to you a lot. I kind of think that's should be rewarded. Do I need the new the iPad? I've got a MacBook Pro, right, 15 inch with the touch bar that I don't use. And I got rid of the iPad Pro 12 inch and the pencil, which I did use. And then I think to myself, I wish I hadn't got rid of the iPad. And now we've got iOS 13 coming around, where it's going to have loads of bells and whistles. I'm thinking, maybe I should have done that. Do I really buy it? It's a lot of money, mate. I mean, I've got to think about this. Uh, what do you think? What was also mentioned on your wonderful app was a guy rung in, forget what his name is now, and he was going on about, do you use the keychain? and Or do you use one password? Well, I was a big lover of one password for a long time, and I've recently removed it from my phone and my Mac. The reason is because I'm quite happy using the keychain. However, what I would like to say is, when I'm in Safari sometimes, it doesn't always recognize that I'm ready to put a password in. I wonder if you know about that. Do I need to go and open this page in Safari? Because it does feel like it's already in Safari. And it has the password thing, Rob. But when I press that, it just makes me, like, log in. Now, I'll tell you what, another thing that annoys me is it doesn't always do that, do you want me to create a password for you, that it does sometimes. I wonder if it just does it for specific web pages that it knows about or whatever. Anyway, as always, loving the show, loving your face, though I don't actually think I've ever looked at you. And as always, have a nice day! Daniel, as always, your comments are greatly appreciated. Okay, we are now almost at the point where I can go over the latest Apple conference call. I have recorded all of this episode so far on Monday night. But before we stop, I will tell you one thing I did recently. After holding Apple stock for a long time, I mean a long time, I sold over 95% of my Apple stock this past month. I just did not like what I'm seeing with regards to financial headwinds, as Apple likes to call them especially in China, and India is not close to ramped up, and then the trade embargo and coming elections and then worse Brexit, where the pound is getting pounded, plus Johnny Ive is leaving, and add on to all of that, I I don't know where 5G is going to be this year. I, I don't see a 5G iPhone happening this year. And the rumored backside bump is so ugly, you would swear it was an Android device. And well, I don't envision good things for the next six to 12 months as far as analysts are going to be concerned. I decided to get out of Apple stock at a little over 205 and we'll sit on the sidelines and see what happens for a little while. Long term, I think Apple's fine, but I just think short term, there is some strong chances and strong probability of a pullback, probably a significant one. And if it pulls back below 160, then I'm going to jump back in with even a stronger position than before. And with that said, let's see if I got out too soon or just in time or it's too early to tell yet. And I'm back. Wasn't that quick? And now we are recording after the Apple quarterly call. Initially, after hours, Apple was up 4%. And after hours trading, that was right after the initial numbers were released prior to the call which beat the streets estimate, the numbers, that is. And after Tim Cook and team explained those numbers and talked about the future and Tim battled allergies, Apple shares were up 4.5%. So I guess some allergies will cause your stock to go up half a percent. Um, So yeah, maybe I should have held on to the shares a little bit longer. Oopsie. Per the call, here is what was revealed. Revenue last quarter, $53.8 billion versus $53.3 billion a year ago and $58 billion uh, last quarter. That was their best June quarter, or what I'd call it, fiscal Q3 quarter ever, which is calendar Q2. 
Total cash on hand, $210.6 billion, down $14.8 billion for the quarter from $225.4 billion. Last quarter sales, iPhone sales, dollar amount, $26 billion. That is down from $29.5 billion a year ago quarter. But as much of that decline from a year ago, it's less of a percentage decline than the previous quarter was. And the previous quarter was $31.1 billion. So actually, it dropped versus a year ago, dropped versus last quarter, but it was still actually good news. By the way, $26 billion is less than 50% of Apple's revenue. I can't remember the last time the iPhone was less than 50%. iPads, $5 billion in sales versus $4.6 billion a year ago and $4.9 billion last quarter. Max, $5.8 billion in sales versus $5.3 billion a year ago and $5.5 billion last quarter. Wearables, and that includes miscellaneous and accessories 5.5 billion versus 3.7 billion a year ago so good increase there and 5.1 billion was last quarter numbers so increase there as well services 11.5 billion so that's the second biggest segment now versus 10.2 billion a year ago quarter and 11.5 billion last quarter so really flat quarter over quarter but good increase year over year Miscellaneous notes, as I mentioned, iPhone revenue was less than 50% of Apple's revenue for the last quarter. That, again, I have to go back and look. I don't remember that happening recently. A dividend of 0, or 77 cents per share, so $0.77 or 77 cents per share, as most of us would call it, uh, will be paid on August 15th to anyone owning shares on August 12th. It's a good thing you're hearing this episode after the quarterly call and you didn't sell your shares like I did. Wearables and services combined equal a Fortune 500 company, or excuse me, a Fortune 50 company. So if you just looked at the wearables and the services, so it's 5.5 billion, 11.5 billion, so you're looking at 17 billion in revenue last quarter, and that's the size of a Fortune 50 company. iPhones installed base at an all-time high, Apple didn't say the number, though. They kept saying all, the iPhone base is at an all-time high, but didn't give them the number of what that base was. Apple Pay launched in 17 more markets in the June quarter, and they completed the rollout in the EU. So Apple Pay is now supported in all EU countries. Apple Card rollout, they did say when that's coming. August. So Apple Card will be out in the month of August. Yay! Intel acquisition was the number two for Apple all time in terms of dollars and number one all time in terms of employees acquired. There are now 420 million paid subscribers in Apple services. And the 5G, uh, Tim was asked at the end of the last question, he was asked, what about 5G? Where is Apple at with regards to 5G rollout for 2020? And he said, it's extremely early innings there, especially globally. Or in other words, Tim was saying not this year for 5G. And as he was answering a question about next year, it's kind of a maybe for next year now. I would put a question mark on 5G for 2020, and I don't see any chance of 2020 this year based on how Tim talked about it. I mean, he said it's really just early, very beginning, you know, baby steps. This is the... I don't know how to reiterate that any more clearly. When he's talked about stuff like this before, when he said it's too early, we didn't see the feature roll out. So I would be very shocked to see 5G this year. In other words, boys, if you're listening, you're not getting what my hand down phone because I'm not going to be upgrading this year. So to wrap it all up, Apple had a good call. The analysts out there seemed to like what they heard. The stock was pushed up in after hours trading. We'll see where it trades tomorrow. Uh, but again, in after hours trading, it was up four and a half percent. And I guess we'll we'll have enough, three months here to see what Apple releases. As I mentioned earlier in the episode, probably around September 10th, we'll have that Apple event and we'll get a feel for what the next round of iPhones are. And, and then we'll have the next quarterly call the end of October. Between now and the end of October, stock more than likely will remain close to where it's at. We shall see. Hey Siri, ask me something. That's my line. Hey Siri, ask me something. I'd really rather answer something. Hey Siri, ask me something. I'm more of the answering type. 
Hey Siri, ask me something. Maybe you should do the asking. Hey Siri, ask me something. If you're trying to get me to talk about woodchucks again, you can forget it. Today's show was again brought to you by Eero, which is by far the fastest and best Wi-Fi I have ever tested. To get $100 off the Eero base unit and two beacons package and one year of Eero Plus, please visit Eero.com slash TII and at checkout enter promo code TII. Before we go today, I want to remind you to send in your feedback to the show, 206-666-6364. That's 206 Moondog. Or record your feedback and email to me the show at todayinios at gmail.com. Feedback can be a question or comment for something someone else said on this episode. Or it can be a question or rant you have about something else. An app, a product review, good or bad. As long as it is iOS related, it is welcomed. I'm always looking for new artwork to feature that you've created on an iOS device. Just put some TII branding on it and send it in, please, and make it square. And of course, we are always looking for more music created on iOS device to play on the show. It's your show and your feedback is greatly appreciated. And don't forget to check out our moderated MeWe community by going to todayinios.com slash community. When you go there, you need to request to be added. I have two questions. The first one seems to quickly weed out the Android fanboys. I ask, which is the better OS, iOS or Android? And the idiot Android fanboys can't bring themselves to say iOS. They say either, both, or Android, and instantly they are rejected. So yeah, it's a nice, safe, Android fanboy-free zone, and you can ask questions or post articles about pretty much anything Apple iOS related. A quick reminder, if you are an app dev or an iBook author, email me if you want your app or iBook featured in the promo giveaway segment for free. Just email me, buy promo codes or more giveaway simply email me at today and ios at gmail.com and please include a 60 second or less audio review of your app or ibook indicating you are the dev or the author also when you send in the promo codes please make sure to let me know when they expire finally check out the ti app which is free to you search for tii in the itunes app store is best way to consume the show and to get push notifications each time a new episode of tii is released it is fully voiceover friendly of course please go right now and download the ti app or get the update Until the next time, I'm your host, Rob, reminding you to phone different. This show is hosted on Lipson.com and part of the Lipson Media Network. If you are looking for podcast hosting, go to Lipson.com, that's L-I-B-S-Y-N.com, for hosting for your podcast and creation of your own smartphone app. The Today in iOS podcast can be found everywhere you listen to podcasts. That includes Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, Overcast, Stitcher, and everywhere else you listen to audio. It's nothing